So let's talk about DDD. Does anyone know what DDD stands for? Distributed development, correct. Correct. You may have heard also about BDD. What BDD means? Well, behavior driven development. I like it. Yes. We'll talk about these things today. So I would like to show you the way I like to approach testing. I've written in my life, I don't know how many tests, but probably about 3,000. Many, 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 many tests. Yeah? Test, testing is vital, as Wendy explained yesterday, to have a, a decent application in the long term. There are many ways to approach testing. The one I would like to show today is unit testing with TDD. In the long term, everyone should be using TDD. At the beginning, this is shocking. I believe no one naturally starts testing using TDD practice. But as I was told many years ago, even if it feels unnatural, if it feels weird, just do it. Even if you don't believe it, do it. If you don't trust it, do it. At some point, it may take a while, maybe weeks, months, you'll realize that's the best way of testing. Yeah? Cool. So, today I got a nap with nothing on it. This is a great React app skeleton. So, I'm going to create a new JavaScript file called uh, Blue tick checker dot yeah. so essentially i want to create a function that determines whether you get a blue tick or not in the code platform according to some parameters so tdd means test driven development and in reality what that implies is that we should create the test before writing the functionality and that's the tricky part in our mind, we create a piece of function, a functionality, and then we test it. Yeah. If I'm creating a new smartphone, I build it, and then it tests. I test it. What happens if I throw against the floor? What happens if I go in, if it goes into the water? Right. In software, it works on the other way around. You test something before it exists. Yeah. It's a bit mind blowing, but it has some advantages. I like the idea. Yeah, it's like a time machine. The the way the reason we do that is. Because if we test things first, you make sure that your code is as simple as necessary. Yeah? It's pretty obvious to see in the long term when you are working with a professional app and you said that the majority of the components are properly tested and everything is okay. Suddenly you realize one of the components that someone wrote a long time ago has zero percent test coverage. That probably implies that component is super complex. Yeah? So a very human friendly way to verify that your code is simple enough is the test coverage. Yeah? So TDD ensures the test coverage is really good. So uh, to prove that, even before writing any single line of code, I'm going to create a test file nearby, as Wendy explained yesterday, blue tick checker. I'll use the same name. What else? Dot test dot js. Correct. So I got two files. Something people underestimate is how important having a good layout is. You know, if you like to race with cards and stuff like that, the first thing you do, you shoot in the card, and then you, you need to feel comfortable, right? Uh, you know, the helmet, the position, the back, the gloves. You just spend maybe a couple of minutes feeling comfortable in that, uh, in that uh, sort of working environment, which is the, the, the card itself. So with testing, it's pretty much the same thing. Before writing any line of code, I need, definitely, everyone needs to be comfortable with the setup. This is very personal. Everyone has different appetites. But also you mind. Because we do test-driven development, we do test first. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have two columns. On the left-hand side, I will have my test. On the right-hand side, I will have my source code. Why? Because, generally speaking, humans will read the screen from left to right. So first I do the test, then I do the call. First I run the, run the test, then I, I run the call, yeah? And eventually, at the bottom, I'll be displaying the output of my test. So, uh, before going into any details, just to prove everything is okay, I'll do a smoke test. You remember what a smoke test is? 
No? Smoke test. Do you know when you turn 18 years old and you get access to your first car that probably belongs to your uncle or to your grandpa, or whatever, it's a very old car. And it's sometimes the engine doesn't, doesn't switch on. So the first thing you do, you try to switch on the, the engine by turning the key and then classic. I think that doesn't make sense anymore. I feel a bit old by telling that story. But again, speaking, if something goes wrong, you go outside, you check from the back of the car and if there is a smoke, that means that at least the engine is running. If there is no smoke at all, that means the car is there, yeah? So that kind of analogy that is completely pointless for new, you know, for teenagers, millennial, people driving Teslas and, you know, this kind of stuff, yeah, it still applies to coding. Smoke test means, let's see if my working environment is ready and then we'll start coding. So what's a smoke test? So I create it, yes, to start doing some coding and then I'll type and um, just testing again i'll delete that in a minute right i just want to see if my test runs so as when explained yesterday first the title of my test and then the expectation expect oops expect true to be true right so that this pass or not probably right true used to be true generally speaking so now i'll run the test in the bottom npm test or run test up to you NPM test, let's leave it there. And what we will next? Look, the test is running, which is good, and then one test passed. Yeah, all good. Of course, let's try the opposite. True to be false. Should fail, right? It does fail. Yeah, cool. So that's, that's fantastic because I can see that my testing framework reacts to my changes quickly. As soon as I save the change, the output reflects the outcome of my test suite. So now it's time to play with the blue tick checker. Let's do TDD. TDD means first, let's think on the expectation. So uh, first of all, let's import a function. Import uh, player has blue tick from blue tick checker something like that. So the first thing, my first test will be, um, so returns false if no data is provided, something like that. So then expect when I invoke the function without any argument, by default, players don't have any blue tick. For instance, a player that has just signed up into the Codiri platform doesn't have the blue tick. Obviously, that won't work. If we pay attention to the outcome, the first thing is blue tick checker is not a function, which makes sense. On the right hand side, we got nothing. But that's the way we work with TDD. We quickly iterate left to right. So on the right hand side, now we need to create a function. We need to export it. And then at least now, let's see what happened. Default function try, export default. Thank you, export default function, whatever. Yeah. So now if we try that, it fails, but now the error is different. We return undefined, which makes sense. There is nothing on the function, but at least the function exists. So now it's time to check something. So that function is expected to receive an argument. So let's call it uh, user data, yeah, something like that. So then here we can do, if I don't have any user data, return what? False. Correct, return false. And now look at what happened with the test. It passes. So that means the first assertion is correct. And then I, I got a question for you. More than a question, this is just a hint. You will see thousands of times in your life, developers type in, should return false. Because of a reason, because of any dark reason, someone decided that was a good idea. That's literally horrible. I massively complain when a developer types should. Because if you type should, it means that you are not fully convinced of what you are doing. Yeah. It means should on an ideal world, no, no, no. Test should be bold. You should be absolutely convinced about what you are talking about. In other words, if you tap 
you they must return something <laughs> strong or to simplify things because all, all your tests will start with mass 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 simply they returns that's it it's not sudden sudden it, it just returns it all the time 100 percent sure right so be bold once you join your first job interview and then you are asked to do some tdd that will happen feel free to point that out yeah it's not about complaining if you have to because for instance that's also a classic scenario you join a test a pairing test and there is some test written and one of them doesn't work and you need to figure out why yeah so it's not about ah who wrote that not again remember to be polite don't complain but i think it's a good opportunity to remind that under your point of view it may be better that that proves coding culture right cool so that looks okay that means i can then go to the next next test so for instance let's think that we want to check if uh, you didn't complete task 24 you don't get the blue tick yeah this is one of the conditions right so returns false if task if current task is less than 24 something like that so then next step is i will again let me create a variable called let user data and then uh, current task equals 23. So now when we invoke the function, player has the blue tick passing that user data, it should return false. Yeah, the test fails. The test should always fail the first time. That's the entire point of TDD. If you do a test and it passes, means you are testing nothing. You're testing a code that doesn't exist, which is completely pointless. So the test should always fail. Expect false, receive undefined, no problem at all. Again, to the right-hand side, let's write that condition. Else if what, guys? It's about what? It's below, below 24. Correct. If it's below 24, yeah. return false. Of course, eventually you, you can probably smell or really quick. We can refactor the code a bit, but we can do that later on. Yeah. With TDD, it's not about creating the perfect code on the first attempt. It's about iterating, small steps. You see, now all my tests are passing. Let's add a second iteration, a second test. So returns false if the player doesn't have any avatar i hope sula is paying attention now Ex again let's create a variable let user data and then something let's, let's have a boolean right has oops uh, has avatar false it's the same thing right so again we call the function expect expect player has blue tick to be false that will fail because again we are not considering that the scenario right so guys you tell me how do we solve that else if what user data the what Equal false like that. We can either do that, equal equal false, or as Billius is suggesting, yeah, to simplify things a bit. Yeah, cool. Then return false. Oh, good, fantastic. Yeah, and then there is uh, somehow a last test. We'll see if this is the last or not. But let's think positively. If user completed at least task 24 and has the avatar, then return true. It, not if, it returns true. If the player uh, has completed task 24 and has avatar, something like that. Yeah? 
So then, let me copy that. I'm a bit lazy today. So user data has avatar and then current task. We need both conditions to be truthy, right? 24 has avatar true. That should return true. Will the test pass or not? No, we are never ever returning true. Still returning undefined. So let's look after that scenario. Can we do that? Else return true. Yeah. I think that will work, right? The thing is, we return false all the time. So if we're still alive here, that means that we got the data, task is at least 24, and we got the avatar. All the conditions are met, and you can see that now the test pass. Yeah? So that's the idea about TDD. However, I'm far away from being comfortable with that code, and I'll tell you why. Yesterday, someone asked, can, do we need to have a individual test? Can we merge them all? So can we have one big spec with all the spec, spec, spec. Technically speaking, that's correct. We can do as many bullshit as we want here, but that's considered an anti-pattern. The test should be dry. In other words, if something goes wrong, if I have, you'll have literally thousands of tests. If one of the tests fails, I don't want to mess around if it fails on line number 20 or 21. I want to clearly, clearly see the line that it fails, 18, and also, also, thanks to having individual tests, I can have individual titles. Remember, one of the underestimated goals of testing is to document. Yeah? So if I wrote the code on the right hand side, the best way to express, to share my intention is not to add crap comments that will easily become out of date. The best way to document it is to have tests on the left hand side. Yeah? That's the way it works. Any questions? There is no difference actually. It depends on the testing framework you are using. In this particular case, we are using yes. Why? Well, because this is what comes bundled with Great React App. One of the good things about yes is that it supports React testing out of the box. So you can react, test your React components, uh, user events, click, on change, all these things. Yeah? Um, there are other frameworks, other frameworks like Mocha. Yeah? Also, test at the end is just a compilation of multiple tools so yes it's just you know it's just grouping several uh, tools um yeah so again every time you switch from yes to a different testing framework there is always some small friction you need to get used to the new syntax so for instance here we used to be yeah to be with the camel case if you use mocha you use two dot equal it's slightly different syntax but it, it takes 30 seconds to get used to one or the other so I wouldn't be that worried. The important thing as the first step is to get used to write this and then the syntax is just a piece of cake. Cool, so again, I'm far away from being comfortable with that code. I'll tell you why, I'll tell you why. Because in reality, uh, so for instance, there is something I, I'm not actually testing. It may be okay by coincidence, but we are, on the unhappy path, we are, for instance, what, what happens if we're on task number 23, but we have avatar? Yeah. So the la I think the last case is the only one where we're evaluating both conditions side by side. But on the others, we're either missing the last task or we are either or we're missing whether it has avatar or not. Yeah. So that's not complete, I don't think, even though that's okay, in reality, you should check all the combinations. If you have two properties, how many tests you need? Two pow two, you need four tests, yeah, to test all the possible combinations. True, true, false, 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 true, true, false. That's the way you make sure that you cover your tests from all the possible angles. Of course, I can, I can literally add a new test and everything, However, I think there's a great opportunity to talk about unrolling. 
which is a very powerful pattern. If you've done a bit of intermediate uh, training, you may have seen that already. Whenever you identify a pattern, and the pattern is all the tests, they have the same look and feel, right? So you have an object with some data, but then you call a function and you expect to return something, true or false. It's the same pattern pretty much for every single test. Whenever you have that, the best thing you can do is to unroll the test. Because otherwise, you need to copy and paste many things too many times. So, how to unroll a test? You can create an array of tests. Yeah? Let me show you how it works. First of all, the title of the text. Then, you can pass a new property, which is user data. And then, you can pass expected or result. Yeah? Why am I doing that? Because now I can do for each, generally speaking, we call this a scenarios. For each a scenario, then run a test, obviously replacing the necessary variables. So the title will come from correct extended title. We can destructure that, right? So we can have it user data unexpected. So then we got it, it variable. Well, maybe it is a bad name because we are using it already. So uh, let's call it. Yeah, I'm not convinced about that, guys. Let's different name uh, or title, name. name. Yeah, whatever. Eh? So title, and then as the argument, we pass user data, and eventually we check expected. Why I do that? Why I do that? Obviously, the test is still passed because I haven't changed any, any assertion. Yeah? I'm just moving things around. The reason why I do that is because now, look at how simple adding new use cases is. It's just adding a new object to the array. It's much easier to read. I can quickly see the coverage of my component. So, let's think about the second scenario. So, title. And then we've got user data. So that object, probably we can inline, I believe. User data. And then expected what? False, correct. And then pretty much the same thing. Let me delete the, that uh, expectation for the next one. It's the same story again, again, and again, right? So. The third expectation, title, and then user data, whatever, and then expected, expected false. So that's the user data as avatar false. Let me remove it. User data as avatar false. And then the last case, right? No, yeah, there is the last case where everything is okay. So on the last case, that's our user data. Let's copy it. So uh, yeah, so we got the title. We'll see in a minute. User data. Something like that. And finally, expect. What do we expect here, guys? True, correct, correct. Let me move the title a bit. And that's it. Right, so now one of the tests one of the tests doesn't work. Let's see why. Uh, number 18, line 18. Being right. It's number expected. Should be expected. Expect oh you're right. You're right, Pelin. You see, it's a typo here. Expected. Correct. And now all the tests pass. Yeah? So to me, this is the ideal way to unroll a test. Because look, you can prepare a good bank of scenarios. Bam, 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 bam. And now it's very simple to extend that. So for instance, um, the return false if the current task is 24. Right. Look at what I'm doing now. I'm going to add a new case that says returns false if current task is about is greater or equal than 24, but user has no avatar. So current task is 24, 
has avatar false. And likewise, the next example says return false if the player doesn't have any avatar. So we can copy it and say it returns false if the player has an avatar, but current task is below 24. Yeah, you see, I'm dealing with every single combination. So current task 23. And I think that's pretty much it. We got six uh, tests. Yeah, uh, they took 0 0.2 seconds to run. So running at least unit tests is are very very cheap. Yeah, so don't be afraid of covering all the possibilities. Do we need to do a test with task number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine? Not really, not really. So the important thing is to cover all the lines in the code, and I think we are covered. Yeah. So now, if someone falls, do you know? Which one is, is failing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, for instance, if we're failing one of the expectations, yeah. one of these failed, I got a line, which, so, Lucia is right at some point, right? It failed number 29, but which one? I got main, you know, which one? If I scroll a bit, look, you got the title, returns false if the player doesn't have any avatar. Okay. So then I can see what is the title, yeah. if the player doesn't have any avatar. Here you go. That's the problem, right? Here's the problem. Why? Okay, if, if avatar is false, oh, expected true. No, that's wrong. Expected false. And then it works. So that's the way TDD works. And one more thing. One more thing. So in reality, in reality, this is pure TDD, but in the long term, you want to write BDD style, which is behavior-driven development. So BDD means instead of actually checking input output which is something very techy try to describe the behavior of your application which is a bit complicated sometimes so maybe you see things like given when and then yeah you've seen that for sure we do that on the codiri platform yeah. so that's a way to explain given i got that when i trigger that action then i expect something yeah so, yeah, we, we can do something similar here. We don't need given. I mean, this, this task is very simple, but we can do, we can do something. When uh, let has blue tick equals, so when I call that function, then expect has blue tick to be whatever. You see? Again, this, this, that test is very simplistic, but you may have a bit more complicated tests where you need to prepare the data, when you may want to mock stuff, you know, this may get a bit more, more tricky. Yeah? So the idea behind BDD is that anyone in your team, including business people, right, like uh, business analysts, product owner, scrum masters, these people, they should be able to understand the code you've written by checking the test. To be honest, in my life, that never ever happened. But the romantic idea behind is to make more descriptive tests so anyone can see what's going on. Yeah, that's BDD. You may have heard about that, like, given, when, then, or triple A, arrange, act, assert. That's pretty much the same, the same thing. Um, any questions? You can use exactly the same pattern yeah, so that's a good point, actually. So this covers the very, 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 very basics about testing. Why? Because the goal of the session is not to explain how to test every single line of code. It's to make sure you get used to test. Yeah. Um, so once you feel comfortable with uh, this sort of input-output testing, to me, the next step is to start dealing with mocks. I'll give you an example. So imagine that you have a React component that uh, the performs a fetch request to the backend. You don't want to perform a fetch request to the backend in your test. Because that's pointless. The test should be isolated, should be a sandbox. Because of that, uh, we can create mocks. Also another example, timer. What happens if you want to display an animation after five seconds? You don't want to wait five seconds to run your, your test, yeah? So yeah, with... Uh, with all these tools we can do testing 
there are different ways to do testing. So again, I don't want to be go that far, but for instance, Jasmine, which is one of the testing frameworks and that you can use as part of Jest. You can use spy on. So spy means we can uh, mock functions if we need them. In the long term, I will strongly recommend you to uh, have a look to something called Sinon or Sinon, never know how to pronounce that. It's one of my favorite testing tools. It's an amazing tool for mocking. Probably one of the most complex aspects in testing is mocking, stabbing, spying. Yeah, so Sinon or Sinon clearly helps on the most complex part of testing. Yeah. And if you do learn that, if you do play with it, don't hesitate to mention it in your CV. Xenon or Sinon is very appreciated. Because if you know Sinon, that means that you know testing. And that's, yeah, you, as you already know, very important. Anything else? No? So again, the message, please do testing. Whatever you do a function, test it. The sooner you start testing your components, the sooner you'll get a good job. So it's up to you. Yeah, you'll never get a good job without testing skills. So to me, when I've been doing, when I've been interviewing people without testing skills, that's a no-go. I don't mind the attitude, that's a no-go. If you cannot test your code, that means you're going to introduce bugs. Yeah, in the long term, mature projects, in mature projects, you spend a lot of time doing bug fixing. Not good. You don't want to spend your life fixing bugs that someone wrote two years ago. So please ensure the quality of your of your software. Of course, we got the uh, reporters, right? As Wendy explained yesterday, we can uh, see how many lines of your code have been tested. If we run with the coverage flag, then you'll see that uh, sexy table that tells you, you see, I got 100% of code coverage. However, look at what happened if I, for instance, remove the last assertion where we check that you get the blue tick if blah, blah, blah. Numbers should move down a bit. Oh, still 100. That's weird. I don't think that's correct, guys. No, but that, that line hasn't been tested, right, at the moment. Uh, hmm, that's interesting. We need to test the test. We need to test the test. Uh, okay, now it moved down. Yeah. I took it, wait a minute. Now it's, it's, not, it's taking a while to reflect the changes. I don't know why. Uh, okay, now, now it's correct. Maybe the first time failed because of whatever reason. Now it's correct. So now you can see, you can see that we are not testing line number nine. And interestingly, look. Oh, you cannot see anything. Look, uh, more or less. And cover lines, that's fantastic. It's telling you which lines of your code hasn't been tested. That's fantastic. Because that means that if there is any bug here, for instance, if I return false, which is wrong, no one will spot the problem. The test will still pass because no one is testing that line. That's why ideally having 100% of test coverage is so important. Yeah? If you have 100% of test coverage, you prove your code is tested and is simple enough. Now you see, it's, it doesn't refresh the changes and you need to run them twice. That's a bit weird. Something wrong with the test runner. But anyway, yeah, the, the second time you run it, it works. Yeah? You see, now I've got 100% test coverage. All good. Fantastic. Anything else? That's a good question. You tell me. So we use Mapper for each. Correct. We shouldn't use map. It will work. If I run map, it will work. No problem at all. However, the feeling you give to your team is wrong. If I'm reading that code, and I find line number 30, I stop trusting that person immediately. Yeah? You don't want to lose trust from your team because it doesn't make sense. Map only makes sense when you want to return something, when you want to transform. I have an array of strings and I want an array of numbers. Yeah? Map makes sense to do one-to-one -one transformation. In here, you don't want to return anything. You don't have any return statement. You just want to iterate. That's why for each, it's much more convenient. Even though both works, performance is probably equivalent, but you know, it's from a readability point of view, it's 
looks better. Anything else? No? Okay, so then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course, we can import as many files as we want, but once again, try to keep your assets dry. In other words, do you remember when we talked about import-export that we recommended to have one export default for each file? Mm -hmm. So taking that, taking that, which is obviously still valid, with the test is the same thing. The test should import one single source code and should test it end-to-end. -end. If you've got a new snippet, a new script, you should create a new test file, you know, and do all the things separately. Again, a commercial piece of software may have thousands of tests. So let's try to tidy up to be as much organized as possible. Mm -hmm. So before finishing this session, uh, it's relatively off topic, but because this is the last, uh, the last workshop about testing, uh, I want to do a very quick introduction about the different types of test that we can run. So what's the name of what we've done so far? That's unit testing. Let me try to display a pyramid, which is going to be a massive failure. Uh, Well, I hope you get the idea, right? You know, when you uh, when you want to go on a diet and you go to the doctor and they show you don't eat this thing, eat that, this pyramid of aliment, of food, yeah. you got that, right? The bread and the milk and all these things. This is what I'm trying to represent here with without too much success. So when we talk about unit testing, that will be here. Ah, excuse me. Uh, I'm doing it on the other way around. It will be at the bottom. Yeah, I'm sure there, there was a much better way to represent that. So unit testing will go at the bottom. What that means? That means the time and energy that you invest on each type of testing. Why there? Because unit tests are easy to write. They run very fast. You know, they document your code. So the majority of the stress on your app so you're going to unit testing. Because if you break your app, it will take milliseconds to detect the problem. Fail fast. After unit tests, and not every company, not every product has all these steps, but generally speaking, we've got things like component testing. So what component testing? That's essentially React testing. You know, React training is a still a sort of unit testing. Proper function, yeah, yeah. Instead of just testing input output, you test user behavior in a simulated way. You don't have a real browser, but you can do on click, on change, you can pass props, you test the real component. Yeah. Very important. Yeah, not as important as unit test, probably, because uh, I mean this is not about importance here, to be honest. That would be a bit controversial. Um, but the thing is, with unit testing, this is very low level, quick component test are not as quick as uh, unit tests as you can see on the, on the platform, right? So then we got things like uh, functional, functional testing. So functional testing, so if, as you can see, we're getting closer to the real user experience. A unit test is a bit artificial, the way we interact. But the more we climb, the closer to real user experience we got. With component testing, at least we do some click, yeah? some eventing, hover. This is closer to what the user expects. So with functional testing, by the first time, we have a real browser. So there are many different tools to use uh, functional testing. You may have heard about some of them, like Protractor, Nightwatch, uh, but I'll tell you my favorite one, which is very trendy, very trendy, very trendy, is back, uh, no, no, this one, sorry, Cypress, cypress.io. That's one of the best tools I've ever used. 
And one of the reasons is classic functional testing required a lot of efforts in the setup. You had to set up things like Selenium, web driver, install things from the command line. That was always a source of problems, especially when you deal with CI tools. However, however, uh, things like uh, Cypress, they have simplified the setup. Everything is JavaScript based. So they managed to run the test without weird dependencies. So it's much easier to start. I love the syntax. I think it's really good. So we can even maybe try to play that video and then we'll give you an idea about how it works. Cypress is an open source test runner of writing Yeah, I also explained the classic problems. And then you see it's an actual browser dealing with your app, including hover, drop, loading spinners, all these things. look good on mobile responsive views. With Cypress, you have much more control over your application. It can write tests in a way that's not possible before today. You can pro Yeah, so that's Cypress, yeah? Uh, to me, my, my only concern with Cypress is even though this it's open source, that's right, if you check on the details of the website, there are some paid plans Depending on what you need, you may have to pay for it. Yeah? So you need to be a bit careful. The alternative to Cypress is called Test Cafe. It's, the good thing about Test Cafe, it has two good things. First of all, the architecture is very similar to uh, Cypress. So you it's, it simplifies things a bit, you, a lot. You don't need to install Selenium with driver. It's very easy to start working with. It's, it's purely open source. So it's completely, it's a classic open source project, which is really good. Maybe the only bit is, I think the syntax to write this is not as human friendly as Cypress, but it's still, it's a, it's a good tool to consider. Yeah, Cypress and, and Test Cafe. What else? We, we keep going up. On top of functional testing, we got end-to-end -end or integration testing which essentially runs the same tools as functional. So you can use Cypress, you can use Test Cafe, but in here, we're actually invoking the backend, which I didn't mention here. So with functional testing, we're mocking. If we need to do fetch to get users, we don't call MongoDB, yeah? We, we simulate, yeah? So functional testing is really good to, to check if the front end behaves correctly. If we simulate that we're on a list of users, can we display them? Yeah. With end-to-end -end or integration tests, we really, really invoke the back end, so we go to the database. These tests are more expensive because we need to be careful. For instance, if we are adding a new player into the platform, what do we do with that player afterwards? So we need to play with testing environments, separate databases. Yeah, it's a bit more complicated. But technically speaking, it can run with the same tools as functional testing. And finally, something that is the, the most recent one, and this is what is becoming very trendy, slowly but steady, is CSS or visual regression. That's literally the UI training we are introducing, hopefully next week. So this is the highest level in the pyramid because here we don't know about fetch, we don't know about React. We just go to a website, we take a screenshot, and then every time we deploy, we take a new screenshot and we compare the images. We don't know the technology running these websites. It's very, very high level. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Sorry, Ricardo. Yep. Why the word regression? Regression. Yeah. That's the way the you know, speaking call it because they check. I mean, to be honest, everything here is regression because with re regression means we try to break code that used to work in the past. So testing is about regression, yeah. But I, because of whatever reason, some people call it visual regression. You can call it visual testing if you want. No. Yeah. So if you go to backstop, I'm not sure if they got any nice, any sexy video. To be honest. Yeah, I started using Backstop at HSBC a few years ago. Uh, I, I, I thought it was a bit experimental, but the idea was literally fantastic. Um, so, I'm not sure if you can get the idea, right? Uh, actually, I think it's even easier just to play a test on the, on the, on the, even locally, right? So, with Backstop, and, that, and then we'll call it a day here. So, 
and then you can see where we are on the on the CSS training. So what you got? You got that image. That image was already generated for us. So the goal is to create the same image by ourselves. So we got on the right hand side, we got the HTML already. Yeah, and at the bottom we got the CSS. So what do you think, guys? If I evaluate that test, will it work or not? Probably not, because we are expecting to display the text in yellow color. Yeah, by default, I don't think it's yellow. So if we evaluate that, it will work faster on AWS, by the way. You see, this is why I like it. Look, reference, that's the, what you try to get, this is what you got. You see the difference, right? So with backstop, you can get the diff. In pink, it remarks the different color. So, and of course that works for multiple devices, yeah, tablets, laptops, and TVs, any device to be honest, you have freedom, yeah, with different resolutions and everything. Backstock, I think, also supports uh, animations, like I want to take a screenshot of my web app after one second, yeah, or after half a second. So if you have a bouncing ball, you can see that the position of the ball is the correct one after every time yeah we haven't incorporated that yet but it would be nice definitely on intermediate and expert so yeah this is backstop and i think that's pretty cool and that's i believe the future of testing again css or visual testing is not going to replace any of these because these are expensive to write it's a bit it takes a, it takes a while but you know you get a lot yeah you get a lot you can take a screenshot of your home page and that's it so if someone breaks your home page in one test, you can spot the difference easily. So this is again the classic pyramid. There is, to be honest, something else at the bottom that you may have heard about, for sure you've heard about that, which is some sort of testing called linting. That's the elegance console. Yeah, semicolons, things like that. That runs even faster than unit tests. That's why this is at the very bottom. Because in reality, you, you don't need to do anything. Yeah, the only thing is to write the standard code. If you put all the semicolons, indentation and stuff, yeah. So, question for you, and last question, link into Bucket's presentation. So, if you got a CI, so every time you deploy, imagine that you have a very powerful piece of software and you have all these steps. So, which one, what should be the order? Top to bottom or bottom to top? Top to bottom. Bottom to top, correct. It should be bottom to top. So a CSS regression test may take 10 seconds to load. Linting may take 0 0.1 seconds. If something is wrong, let's detect the issue the sooner the better, right? That's why CI should run from the fastest to the slowest. Anything else? Yeah. You know when um, the UI testing, you can do it in cycles. I've seen it in Lebanon. UI testing? UI. What do you mean UI testing? In terms of testing to see if the, let's say, the colors and the user interface. The, the visual. Ah, can you do that with Cypress? Yeah, yeah, with Cypress. Okay, yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's fantastic. I didn't know. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, great. It's, yeah, yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah? What is the cycle to deliver now? So with, com with component testing, we don't run a real browser. We run maybe a simulated browser. So component testing is just a JavaScript function that simulates a DOM with React. With is the one we, we yeah, component testing, this is, this is React training. Ah, nothing else, nothing more. The behavior of yeah, so unit testing is JavaScript training. Component testing is React training. Both have linting. Yeah? Uh, UI training will be the one on top. Yeah? So we'll be missing these two. Anything else? No? Cool. So that was it, guys. Thank you. Thank you.